So hands up, how many of you have bought one of those new DNA testing kits? Oh yeah, 23 and me over here. Um, did it, you know, I think like everybody wanted to find out, am I really German or Scandinavian or is there maybe a wee bit of Irish in me um, that I can celebrate St. Patrick's Day a little more? Um, I think everybody tr does the testing for different reasons. Um, they now have that health level to them, so people are diving in to try and find out a little more about their health and, you know, within their family tree, what health uh, markers they can maybe look for. So it was only a matter of time for the DNA um, industry to dive into and mesh with the funeral home industry. When we have a deceased in our care, it's essentially the last opportunity to get DNA from somebody. So they came up with these kits and they approached funeral homes and it has become a growing industry that the funeral directors are doing the swab of the deceased mouth before they're cremated or embalmed. Cremation destroys DNA. Embalming breaks apart a lot of the DNA strands so it's hard to find a full DNA strand after embalming. So it is a natural kind of meshing of two worlds with the funeral home and the DNA companies. A lot of other reasoning goes into this as well with the health markers. You can maybe down the road um, as the industry progresses and as technology progresses, there are so many more things that can maybe be derived from having DNA of somebody who has gone before us in our family hereditary you know, kind of history. And so having that kind of banked, having that on file, we can then go back once the technology catches up or becomes discovered, that we can go back and look at previous generations ancestry DNA breakdown um, to see how it affects ours. If you can find down the road, maybe they can find earlier markers and precursors to Alzheimer, or maybe for your specific type of cancer that seems to run in your family, they can make a personalized medication for your genetic makeup. And they can use that previous DNA for that. So there are actually a lot of reasons that you would want to bank DNA. I asked the question though, why would maybe someone want to not give their DNA while they were living? A lot of generations and a lot of people don't play into or want to have their DNA on file. Maybe it's big man is watching or maybe they're tracking me, which is a very common thought process nowadays with cell phones that listen to us and why would we give them our DNA? Why would we just be forthcoming with that? So there are some reasonings and there's also people wanting to take secrets with them. You know, we do have the Jerry Springer moments where somebody wants a paternity proven and so they want to swab because of that reason. Um, but there are also very many other reasons that people want to do this. One thing that companies have come up with is keepsake memorabilia as well. A DNA is just like a fingerprint. It's specific to one individual. And so just like there's fingerprint jewelry and fingerprint, I guess, merchandise that you can do to commemorate a loved one, same with the DNA. You can get DNA jewelry. You can get like sculptures that have the DNA placed inside of it. So it's kind of a whole new world that we're looking at and a new thing within the, the funeral business that we can connect in DNA, not just fingerprints, but a much deeper core part of who a person was we can capture for a family. So as you go to funeral homes now, you may start seeing displays that are talking about DNA or a funeral director may ask you if you want to bank the DNA of the loved one they're caring for. It is not a crazy question. It's not just them trying to sell you something else, but it's them allowing you that last opportunity before that DNA is destroyed for you to bank it. And you can bank it. Some places allow you to keep it at your home because it's so stable, or you can bank it with a facility. Possibilities are endless. 
So wanted to share a little story with you about why DNA has been <clears throat> kind of a big part of the last few months with my family. So uh, back in the 80s, the early 80s, there were four women. And these four women um, were all wanting to be mothers, but they could not um, get pregnant for either fertility issues or one of them, the husband had had a vasectomy. Another was a single mom who just wanted another child and, you know, was not with anybody at the time. So they sought out a legal means, which was artificial insemination. Um, so there's a random man that donated a sperm and all four of these women happened to get the same donor. Back in the day, there was not a lot of fertility options to help um, with situations. And so kind of under the radar, under the table, artificial insemination became a thing. It wasn't well tracked back then. Um, there's a lot to it we're still trying to figure out. Um, fast forward to 2019, those four women could never have imagined that DNA would allow their children to know the truth about the situation. Unfortunately, those are secrets, as I had talked about before, that may come out because of DNA and because of researching and doing these Ancestry.com and 23andMe and various other DNA testing kits. So these four children from across the country this year <laughs> got their results. Ping, you have a half brother. Ping, you have a half sister. My husband is one of these four kids. Have you heard these stories that keep coming out that you know, people meet their half siblings or their, you know, grandparents they never knew or their parents they never knew, you know, from adoption, they're getting connected back to different places. So all these mothers had chose artificial insemination and their kids are now able to connect with the brothers and sisters from the donor, but they don't know the donor. So some secrets have come out but what a blessing that these four kids now have all these new half brothers and sisters. Um, they've all gotten together. They've all met each other. I stood and stared at my husband's new half brother because of how similar they look. I got, I have goosebumps saying it. It's so crazy that somebody out there can be related to you and you don't know about it. But DNA has brought these DNA testing kits are now, are now so readily available that you could get this information. So that is why I think when we look at banking DNA and gathering DNA from a deceased, when it is our last opportunity, it is not a bad thing. Sometimes secrets need to stay secrets or let lie, but the advancements that could help us in the future with health, and diseases and medications that we can't even fathom may happen down the road is why it is a great idea to do. You know, these four women back in the 1980s could never have imagined what, you know, almost 40 years later could happen with DNA. Never thought that it would be a possibility. So it, in 40 years, what are going to be possibilities and realities in our world? And what diseases can we eradicate? And what medications can we, you know, make that could prevent and stop? And just the things are, I think we can't even dream up the things that are going to be possible down the road. So that's a little um, tidbit for you on DNA and the deceased and how they're connecting and why they're connecting now and what could be possible in the future. So I would really love to hear your stories about DNA testing. And if you've done 23andMe or Ancestry.com and if you did find any surprises, did you find some new brothers and sisters you never knew you had? Or maybe you grew up thinking you were German and you ended up being Scottish. 
love to hear those stories. Um, share with me also if you have banked your loved one's DNA and what you are hoping to get from that information down the road and if you've made jewelry or, um, you know, keepsake pieces. Love to hear your stories about all of it. As always, comment below. Make sure you like the video if you like it and send me emails if you need any questions answered immediately. Carrie at CarrieNorthy.com. Thanks. Mm -hmm.